LexisNexis has generously supported this special event. LexisNexis has been an important partner to the School of Law and is a great resource as we try to train problem-solving lawyers who will make creative contributions to their clients, the justice system, and our communities. Kenneth Feinberg has played a key role in resolving some of our nation's most challenging and widely known disputes. Ken graduated from NYU Law School, where he served as an editor of the Law Review. He then clerked for New York's Chief Judge Stanley Fold. He was a federal prosecutor for three years in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan before he moved to D.C. and served Senator Edward Kennedy with distinction, rising to the position of Chief of Staff. In the mid-1980s, Mr. Feinberg shifted his career from advocate and negotiator for clients to work as a full-time neutral, a mediator at Kay Scholler in Washington, D.C. I was very fortunate to work with him there for several years on some large-scale mediation matters. In 1992, Ken founded Feinberg Rosen, where he specializes in ADR, Alternative or Appropriate Dispute Resolution. <coughs> Mr. Feinberg currently serves as the administrator of the $20 billion fund set up by British Petroleum in connection with the Gulf oil spill. And we're grateful that he's willing to come in the midst of his work to talk to us about it tonight. He is best known, however, for serving as a special master of the federal government's September 11th Victim Compensation Fund. He shared that experience in his book, What is Life Worth? The Unprecedented Effort to Compensate the Victims of 9-11. I highly recommend this book. Ken will be signing copies tonight if you're interested after the presentation. I've had recommended it to students and, and I really enjoyed it. Even for non-lawyers, it's a wonderful read. Mr. Feinberg has been involved in numerous tort and commercial disputes, spanning a wide range of topics and types of disasters. A good portion of his work has been pro bono, including his 911 work, which sets a marvelous example for all of us. Ken truly loves teaching, and he's been an adjunct professor for law schools at Georgetown, Columbia, Virginia, and many other universities. In 2004, he was named Lawyer of the Year by the National Law Journal, and has been named repeatedly as one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America. Ken, we are honored by your presence tonight. Given your hectic travel schedule and the weighty matters you're handling for our country, we are proud and grateful that you've chosen to spend time with us. After Mr. Feinberg speaks about his work, we'll welcome two distinguished panelists who will ask him questions from the perspectives of torts law as well as from ADR process law. First, we'll welcome my friend Jay Fulberg. Jay served 10 years as dean at the University of San Francisco School of Law and is currently professor emeritus there. He works with the Judicial Arbitration and Mediation Services, or JAMS, the largest private alternative dispute resolution provider in the world, and Jay heads the JAMS Foundation. Jay has resolved complex disputes on a wide variety of subjects, and one I thought might interest you was his involvement in designing quality control measures used in the claims of African American farmers against the U.S. Department of Agriculture, involving over 22,000 claimants and over $1 billion in settlement funds. This settlement involved the largest civil rights class action in the U.S. to date. Dean Fulberg is considered one of the great leaders of ADR practice and scholarship, with decades of experience as a mediator and arbitrator. He is skilled at getting to the heart of complex issues and dealing with human factors so important to settlement. He is the author of numerous books and articles on ADR. He's co-authored an ADR text with me, Tom Stevanovich, and Dwight Golan, and whenever the three or four co-authors needed a mediator, we all immediately turned to Jay. So Jay, thanks so much for joining us from San Francisco tonight to share your own expertise. Next, we turn to our own dear professor, Tom Hagel. Since coming to the School of Law in 1982, Tom Hagel has received the 2003 Alumni Association's President's Award for his excellent work and has been named Professor of the Year by our law students. He is a Master of the Bench of the Local American Inn of Court 
as well as an acting judge for the Dayton Municipal Court, a commissioner on the Montgomery County, Ohio Veterans Services Commission. He represents members of the disabled American veterans and really leads our community on veterans' issues. Professor Hagel teaches torts, evidence, and criminal law. He's the author of numerous publications in Ohio criminal law and procedure, as well as evidence law. He presents regularly at Ohio and National Bar Association events and is a member of the ABA's Committee on Training Trial Advocates. Thank you, Professor Hagel, for participating in tonight's special event. Now, I'm thrilled to turn the courtroom over to our special guest, Ken Feinberg. Welcome to the Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, thank you. The Dean mentions my book, What Is Life Worth? Public Affairs Press, 2005. Now, you may have trouble finding this book today in, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble. Don't worry. My personal supply of my book is virtually inexhaustible. <laughs> So if anybody has trouble, just let the dean know we'll get you a copy or get a copy afterward. I'm really here today, um, very short window, but I'm here really for two reasons. First, the dean, an old friend, a colleague, has asked me every year for the last 10 years to come to Dayton. And when I learned that she was passing the baton at the end of her tenure, there was no way I wasn't going to repay a debt and come out here for a few minutes to visit Dayton Law School, a great law school indeed. Secondly, when the dean sweetened the offer by saying that Jay and Tom would act as sort of responders to brief comments by myself, that iced it. Um, they're both, of course, national figures. And uh, it's a great opportunity to engage a little bit uh, with this audience as well. So that's why I'm here. I wish I could stay longer, I must say. Um, but in any event, I wanted to spend a little bit of time. Now, in about a half an hour, I can summarize exactly what the title of my talk means when we talk about unconventional responses to unique disasters. Because what I'm doing now with BP, what I did in the 9-11 fund, Virginia Tech, Pazar, Agent Orange, you're talking about a half dozen, maybe, unique situations where policymakers, whether they be judges, whether they be the Congress, whether they be the administration executive branch, or whether they be private parties, policymakers decide that there are very rare situations where the conventional way we go about resolving disputes, the courtroom, the adversary system, you pick a lawyer, I'll pick a lawyer, the lawyers will do battle with the judge as the umpire. There are a very few situations in American history where that approach is deemed to be ill-advised. I am asked all the time, can we take the examples that you have been involved in, like BP and 9-11, and can we use them as precedents to change the way we resolve disputes on a more regular basis? And my answer remains the same as it has for the last 30 years, 25 years. No. No. These examples that are my niche are one-off examples. They are a precedent for nothing. They have to be examined in the context of why they were created, what goals they seek to serve, and why, even if they work, they are successful in achieving the objective, they should not be replicated. 
And they shouldn't. And they shouldn't. Now, it doesn't really matter when you look at these examples whether a judge does it. In Agent Orange, it was Judge Weinstein in the Eastern District of New York that decided we ought to set up a special program to aid Vietnam veterans. That's how I got involved in this with Chuck Hagel, Tom's brother. That's how I got to know Tom. We set up a program in Brooklyn to fund a settlement to assist Vietnam veterans. It was a unique project. The Second Circuit approved the project, but said, don't ever come back here again with this. You can do it this time. Don't come back with another one. A judge did that. 9-11 was Congress. 11 days after 9-11, Congress passed a law creating the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, funded completely by the taxpayer. 100%. Taxpayer funded. Families of 9-11 victims, if you want to voluntarily give up your right to sue and come into a special fund funded by the taxpayer, we will pay you. You don't have to. But if you want to get quick payment without going to court and suing the airlines or Massport or the Port Authority or Boeing, come on in. We've created a special taxpayer program only for you. Everybody came in. 94 people didn't come in. Bill's heard all this before. 94 people didn't come in. Everybody else came in. And the 94 that didn't come in went and filed a lawsuit, and they settled. Virginia Tech wasn't Congress. It wasn't the judge. It was the president of Virginia Tech. 32 people killed by a deranged gunman in rural Blacksburg, Virginia. Who would have thunk it, right? You send your kid to school in the middle of nowhere, and a deranged gunman, a kid, arms himself and kills 32 people. The president of Virginia Tech calls and says, Mr. Feinberg, we have $8 million in unsolicited private contributions. We don't know how to distribute this money. Will you help distribute it? Design it and distribute it. So we did. Pazar wasn't even a tort. It was a reaction by Congress to the financial meltdown of 2009. Populist revulsion at what Wall Street did to the country. Congress passed a law. The top 25 corporate officials in each of seven companies that received the most taxpayer assistance shall have their compensation determined by the Secretary of the Treasury. And he shall delegate to, in this case me, you figure out what to pay these people. 175 people. I mean, the law is largely a sideshow, but with great public interest. What is he going to pay these bums on Wall Street that got us into this jam? Maybe they ought to give all their money back. That ought to be their pay. I mean, it was a, 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 um, a circus. And finally, what I'm doing now, BP. Now, that's not Congress. It's not a judge. It's the administration sitting down with BP and, and shaking hands. Look, we don't need a statue. BP, you will promise to put up $20 billion or more to pay all the victims of the oil spill in the Gulf. And we both agree, let Ken Feinberg do it. And that's what I'm doing. In seven months, seven months, the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, we've paid out $3.6 billion to about 200,000 people. Nobody's happy. Nobody. Everybody in the Gulf says, I'm being too cheap, I'm not being generous, I'm going too slow. And BP files a brief saying, you're way too generous, you're paying too much, there's no further damage. Must be doing something right. So. That, th those are the situations. Now, before you make the argument that this is a wonderful idea, 
these programs get everybody out of the courtroom and you, you set up a separate facility that is much more efficient, much speedier, much more impact, much more generous, much more certain, be very careful because you run into a pile of challenges. Challenge number one is not a legal challenge as much as it is a philosophic problem. And it is a very serious philosophic problem that could occupy our attention for an entire semester. A perfect course for Hegel to teach. Perfect. He could make it up as he goes along. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. What a wonderful idea that the government or BP or private individuals set up these funds to help people who are the victims of life's misfortune through no fault of their own. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. But be very careful because it is a very, very close call, I must say. You should have read some of the emails I got when I was administering the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Dear Mr. Feinberg, my son died in Oklahoma City. Where's my check? Dear Mr. Feinberg, my son was killed by terrorists on the USS Cole. How come I'm not eligible? And it's not Dear Mr. Feinberg, I don't get it. My daughter died in the basement of the World Trade Center in the original 1993 attacks committed by the very same people. Why aren't I eligible? Where's my check? And it's not just terrorism, you see. Dear Mr. Feinberg, I'm sitting in my, at my desk writing you this letter because I am totally, totally frustrated. I've read what you're doing with the 9-11 victims. It's wonderful, but I don't understand. Last year, my wife saved three little girls from drowning in the Mississippi River, and then she drowned a heroine. Where's my check? Before you carve out for a very special treatment, a very small segment of the victims of life's misfortune. Bad things happen to good people every day in this country. I didn't see any 9-11 fund for Katrina. A thousand people died with Katrina. You don't see a 9-11 fund when there's a fire in Dayton and through no fault of their own, three little kids die in a fire. Where's their check? You better be very, very careful in trying to carve out programs where you try and make distinctions based upon the status of the victim. I don't believe it can be done. It certainly can't be done in a very convincing way as far as I'm concerned. Now, the 9-11 fund was the right thing to do. It was sound public policy. It was sound public policy from the perspective of the American people, not from the perspective of the victims. To the extent that your elected officials pass a law that says we want to demonstrate our cohesion, our sense of community with the victims. We want to show the world how we take care of our own. And we want to divert people from litigating that will tie the courts up in knots for years. Great idea. And that's what we did. And I've said in my book, and I've said publicly over and over again, it was the right thing to do. Don't do it again. Certainly don't do it by asking one person to calculate, in the case of 9-11, 5,200 awards. And now with BP, I'm being asked to calculate damages for 750,000 claims in the Gulf of Mexico. One person. Now, you better be careful. You guys have taken administrative law at Dayton Law School. 
You better be careful when you delegate to one person this type of authority, you know. If it works, oh, it's great, you know. This is really a good plan. If it doesn't work, and you've asked one person to do it with no checks and balances and no appeals and no real committee, no real structure other than wise discretion, it's problematic. It certainly isn't very good political science. But you do the best you can. But that's why, um, uh, although the trial bar is often at odds with me, I don't really think the trial bar is critical of me as much as the trial bar is concerned about the institutional precedent of allowing a certain segment of people to have their compensation determined outside of the conventional classroom the conventional courtroom. Now, when you look at BP, you see, you, you decide as a matter of discretion, where do you draw the line? See, where do you draw the line? What constitutes an eligible claim? Now, this is where tort law and Hegel, and all of the students here that have taken torts, you see a very practical problem. Very practical problem. If you're in the courtroom in BP, you will discuss proximate cause, was your damage related to the spill, motions to dismiss, legal briefs, juries, and the judge and jury in our traditional legal system will decide as a matter of public policy. It's one thing to, to compensate a hotel in Pensacola where oil washes up on the beach. It's quite another to compensate a dentist who has an office five miles from the beach and who says, I lost half my patients because half my patients were fishermen. They can no longer fish in the Gulf. They're not getting paid. They can't afford dentistry. I have been harmed. Pay me. Now, I suspect that in a final tort one, proximate cause exam. It's going to be tough to extend the law of torts to the dentist. But I'm not bound by a strict adherence to the law and frankly even if I was bound by it you would get a good deal of disagreement by very emotional claimants in the Gulf as to whether or not the dentist ought to be compensated. So what you try and do in BP is try and come up with a formula, a methodology for determining eligibility and even if you're eligible, calculation of damage. Calculation of damage. And this traditional tort co concept of direct versus indirect causation looms very, very large. It's a very practical problem. You may think it's a law school tort problem. Believe me, it's a very practical problem. Where do you draw the line? Who gets the billions? Or are you just going to send a check to everybody in the Gulf of Mexico? It's a problem. Even on the beach, it's a problem. Mr. Feiberg, I own a hotel. There's no oil on the beach. None. But the press gave the impression that the oil was arriving. And as a result, I'm on the beach and I lost half my bookings. There's no oil. Doesn't matter. 
Everybody in the north read that there was oil coming and went to Jamaica instead of Pensacola. Pay me. Here's my causation. No oil. I'm on the beach. Before the spill, I had 81% bookings. After the spill, I had 61% bookings. Now, what do you think is the reason? Pay me. Well, do we have any evidence that it was the spill that caused it? You've got to be kidding. What do you think caused it? Before the spill, 81%. After the spill, 61%. Now, the fact that in another hypothetical, my hotel is in Tampa, on the west coast of Florida, 500 miles from the spill, that doesn't matter. Pay me. Ah, no, wait, wait. I'm in Key West. I'm a thousand miles from the spill. Pay me. Before the spill, after the spill, in between the Miami papers and the Tampa papers and everybody saying the oil is coming. Turn on CNN and watch that oil every day blowing out of that rig. Pay me. Mr. Feinberg, I own a restaurant in, in Dayton. <laughs> you laugh. I own a restaurant in Dayton. We serve the best shrimp scampi in Ohio because we get our shrimp from the Gulf. We can't get the Gulf shrimp anymore. People aren't coming to the restaurant for scampi. And our revenue is down 11%. Pay me. Well, you know, proximate cause, Hegel from 30,000 feet, you know, the law doesn't... <laughs> no, no, no. That may work in a courtroom. You know. Right now, I got a claim here, and my governor is saying, pay me. The governor of Ohio says, pay me. So... And the 9-11 fund, you have, the, you have different problems in the 9-11 fund. But you still got to decide, as a practical matter, death was easy in 9-11 fund. I mean, you were either on the airline manifest, you were a Pentagon military person, or you, were, uh, you got a death certificate from the city of New York. I mean, proving death is rarely a problem. Calculating damage, that's another question. But proving death is rarely a problem. Physical injury is a problem in 9-11. Physical injury, that's a problem. Mr. Feinberg, I saw those planes hit that World Trade Center, and even though I lived three miles away on East 96th Street, I fell down and broke my leg. Pay me. Mr. Feinberg, I live in Jersey City across the Hudson. That, when those World Trade Center buildings collapsed, that plume went over, wafted over into New Jersey. I breathed that guck. Now I have emphysema. Pay me. Pay me. Pay me. All right, everybody, Virginia Tech, 32 people died, and I'm going to give everybody, I've uh, thought it over, I've got $8 million, and I'm going to give every death claim the same, $212,000 each. Students, everybody gets the same. Life is the same. Wait a minute, Mr. Feinberg, I don't understand. There were 32 people who died. 31 were students. My spouse was a faculty member earning $160,000 a year. Why are you giving me the same as a non-income worker, a student on scholarship? Don't I get more since the one person who died was a, was a wage earner? What about torts? What about economic loss? Isn't that a taught concept that should guide you in, in Virginia Tech? Well, no, I think that um, all life is equal. Where did you read that? That all life is equal? What have you been reading? Certainly in America, all life is not equal. When people get up and say, you know, under the 9-11 fund, you had to give everybody a different amount of money to attract them out of the tort system. The governor of Oklahoma said to me, you know, that is very un-American. 
giving everybody who died on 9-11 a different amount of money. And I said to the governor of Oklahoma, I said, Governor, you may be right that it's not a good idea, but I'd be very careful about saying it's un-American. Every day in Dayton, every day, judges and juries in Dayton give more money to the banker or the stockbroker than they do to a, a waiter or a busboy if they get hit by a car. That's economic loss. That's a, a time-honored principle of the tort system. So, what a problem that was with 9-11. Mr. Feinberg, my husband died. He was a fireman. A fireman. You're giving me $2 million. You're giving the widow of the banker who died in the World Trade Center working for Enron $3 million. Why are you demeaning the memory of my husband? Why are you giving me a million dollars? Well, ma'am, I'll tell you why. Under the American tort system, economic loss, blah, 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 blah. That got me nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. See? So that's, those are some of the problems, you see. So I draw sort of a summary here. And I say to myself, are these programs a good idea? Are they sound public policy? That's the, the quintessential question. My answer? I think they're probably a good idea. I mean, after all, if public policy makers and, and uh, people who design these programs subject to the will of the electorate, if they think that on rare occasions the qualitative, quantitative nature of the disaster compels this type of program, fine with me. But just make sure you can maintain a healthy degree of skepticism about this stuff. I really hope that when BP is over, I go back to ADR and other things, working with the dean and other people, you know, and there isn't another tragedy. But we know better. We know better. Life isn't like that. So there will be another tragedy. And once again, people will think about, should there be an alternative mechanism? Maybe, but the point I make tonight when we talk about <clears throat> unique responses or unconventional responses to unique disasters, they are very unconventional, out of the mainstream. They are very unique disasters that we're talking about, but I think on balance, they should be used very, very rarely for only the best motivation, the best intentions, and we shouldn't look to them as a precedent. So those are some, uh, some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A lot to get us started, and we do want to allow the audience to ask a few questions. So I'll ask Professor Fulberg, Dean Fulberg, first to, uh, to talk a little bit with Ken and, and get you to engage. Okay. I think you can speak into your microphones or stand, whatever you prefer. Ken. I admire your unconventional work and think the ABA got it right when on the cover of the ABA journal last month they had a big picture of Ken Feinberg and they dubbed him the master of disasters. <laughs> Be good on a, on a eventual tombstone a hundred years from now. Um, thank you for carrying the ABA ball forward, you have benefited all of us with your innovation and your good work. Uh-oh. <laughs> I have a second question that you will maybe I'll owe, but I want to ask you one thing that was just sparked by your comments, and that is uh, we have a new unique situation, and that is uh, if you were asked by executives of General Electric, maybe you already have been, who designed the um, the reactors and the containment system at the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant in northeast Japan. Uh, what they might do uh, regarding potential claims that are surely going to come. What might you advise them? And even though each situation, as you well pointed out, is very different, one isn't the precedent for the other, we nonetheless have something here 
that might draw on your vast experience. Can you make any parallels or distinctions for us, please? Nuclear accidents have been regulated for 40 years in this country. Go, go into the library and look up the Price-Anderson Act. They have a Price-Anderson Act in Japan. The nuclear industry in Japan over the last 30 years has paid into a fund that probably now is $4 billion. It'll probably cost five or ten times that to pay all the Japanese citizen claims. Under Price-Anderson, and I'm, I'm fairly confident, Japanese law, which doesn't have a litigious society like we do, once that private insurance is exhausted, the government steps in to pay the difference. So I don't think GE is going to come to me. I think there is a plan. There is in the United States the, the Price-Anderson Act. If there is a nuclear catastrophe, private insurers pay up to a certain level, and if that level is exhausted, it's expected by law that the government will step in. Ken probably doesn't remember this, but my memo as a first-year associate at K. Scholler, the first thing I had to write about was the Price-Anderson Act. <laughs> Thank oh. you. Professor Hagel. Uh, mine goes to uh, the uh, settlement process in the, in the BP case. Uh, we all know that uh, if you have two parties out there who have a conflict uh, and uh, somebody's trying to negotiate a settlement, uh, both parties are going to have to sit back and make some determination of uh, the pros and cons of going along with it. They're going to have to weigh a number of factors, including uh, the risks of litigation. Uh, what happens if uh, they uh, don't go through with a settlement, they go to trial, uh, what are the uh, possible outcomes? Uh, it could be evidentiary, procedural issues. Uh, one of the uh, concerns and I think that interests me is that the BP situation is uh, unique in terms of it being a, a mass disaster that has uh, consequences that so far uh, I don't think anybody knows uh, for sure what they're going to be. So let's say that you are a, a potential claimant. Uh, you uh, have done your best uh, to come up with uh, some type of an estimate of your losses. Uh, but let's say you are a, a member of uh, the fishing community there and uh, you say that, well, uh, I've been told that uh, the pollution has uh, killed off these marshes, that it's going to take a generation to come back, but there's really no science behind it because it's never happened before. Uh, how is it, when you're trying to negotiate these settlements, how is it you determine these issues? Fabulous question. First, the Gulf Coast Claims Facility has gone to all of the scientists and all of the experts. What do you guys think about the long-term impact of the spill in the Gulf? What do you think? And to the extent that you can get a consensus, it seems to be a consent, not sure, reasonable. The Gulf ought to be back to normal by the end of 2012. Not this year, but next year. Should be back to normal. But, you know scientists, right? But, no one knows for sure. Right? <laughs> no one knows for sure. There could be oil in the seabed waiting for a hurricane, a tsunami, or whatever. No one knows for sure, but we think by the end of 2012. Now, what we have done in the Gulf Coast Claims Facility in direct response to Professor Hagel's question is offer people a choice, every claimant. You can take a final payment based on what we think is a reasonable prediction of the future will give you a final payment. Your 2010 losses documented times two for 11 and 12. Or, if you are risk averse, if you're not certain about the future, if it's unclear and you want to wait and see, you can instead take a quarterly payment every quarter Document your past damage and keep coming back with documented damage every quarter and keep going. Don't take a final payment until you're more comfortable 
that the risk has subsided. So that's your choice, a voluntary choice. Now remember, though, under the enabling ledger, under the, the ESCO agreement setting up the facility, it only lasts until August of 2013. So technically, if you haven't made up your mind by 2013, you'll then have to go and sue. But until then, if you want, you can take quarterly payments, or if you're, if you're not risk averse and you want a final lump sum, here's your check now payment, that's your alternative. Ken, in your book, you talk about how people reacted, the families, to in 911. Some families blamed God for this tragedy. Others went the other way and said this is the will of God, which incensed the other families. So these emotions are deep, whether it's the Fisher families in the Gulf or 911. How do you deal with the emotions? What's the proper role of emotions in this work? That, that's the $64 problem, you see, emotion. We lawyers are much too reasonable, rational, analytic, right? Lawyers. I would have been better off in 9-11 with a divinity degree. With a divinity degree. Because you're dealing with, with understandable emotional people. Anger, frustration, disappointment. Why my husband? He was a great man. Why did God take him from me at the World Trap? I mean, you deal with this. We gave people a chance to be heard, to come in and have a hearing in 9-11. Nobody came to have a hearing to talk about money. They came to talk about their dead spouse or their dead child or their dead family loved one. Mr. Feinberg, thank you very much for this hearing. I appreciate it. I'd like to start the hearing. I was married for 25 years to my husband. He died at the World Trade Center. I'd like to start this hearing by playing you a video of our wedding 25 years ago. Well, Ms. Mrs. Jones, you don't have to play that video. It, it'll upset everybody, and it won't have anything to do with your compensation. And I want to play that video. I want you to see what those murderers did to my, my loving husband. Play the video. So, I mean, emotion. We see it in the Gulf, too. I can't fish. I'm not able to fish because they closed the fishing grounds, the spill. I lost $30,000. Pay me. Well, okay, but um, documentation? What do you mean? Well, I'm going to send you a 1099. I waive it. You can't waive a 1099. <laughs> you're going to get, I mean, you've got to document your claim. See? The problem. Don't, I don't want the money then. It's a problem. Professor Fulberg. Can neutrality is considered a central part of a neutral's role in resolving claims between an injured party and those the injured party claims responsible for the injury. Does your arrangement with BP and the reported funds, 850000 as it was reported uh, in the journals, uh, monthly to your firm as well as expenses, um, does that raise any question about your neutrality and independence? I know you've had to respond to this. I'd just like uh, to hear more comments about it. Absolutely. Do, does the fact that BP, as the responsible party for the spill, the fact that BP is paying the freight for the entire cost of the program, does that undercut the perception that Feinberg is in the tank for BP and is just trying to help BP. I'll say it makes my job that much more, much more difficult. Now, of course, who else is going to pay but BP? I mean, who, who else is going to pay the cost? Forget me for a minute. Who else is going to pay the cost for 3,200 people working on this facility? 35 claims offices in the Gulf where people can walk in and file a claim. Electronically, you can file a claim. 250 uh, accountants calculating damage awards. BP's the only one that can pay the freight. The government isn't going to pay. You can't ask a claimant to pay for the cost of getting their claim processed. So it absolutely causes problems. Perception. Feinberg's getting paid by BP 
And since he's getting paid by BP, he's not really trying to pay us generously. He's trying to save money for BP. It's a big problem. Now, of course, you try and throw the statistics at people and say, well, you know, in, in, in uh, seven months we're paid three and a half billion. The money's going out the door. Anybody who doesn't like my rulings can go to the Coast Guard Liability Trust Fund under the Federal Oil Pollution Control Act, and they can review my decisions, and in 427 decisions, they've affirmed me 427 times. I must be doing something right. Doesn't change the perception. It's a, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Professor Hagel. Um, all through this disaster, there's uh, been news reports that uh, there are some independent contractors that may have some liability here. The people who uh, uh, constructed uh, the uh, rig, uh, some people who did some cement work around the uh, drilling site, uh, some other independent contractors. Uh, how is it, uh, this, the settlement that a claimant might make with BP, what effect, if any, does that have on uh, potential third-party defendants? If a claimant accepts a final payment from the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, as with 9-11, the claimant surrenders all rights to sue anybody arising out of the spill. I mean, if the Gulf Coast Claims Facility has made the claimant whole, you suffered X dollars in damage, you documented it, we paid you. You have been made whole. You don't need extra money from a co-defendant because you've been made whole by the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. Also, it makes no sense. If, if you can go sue Transocean or Halliburton, Transocean and Halliburton will cross-claim back against uh, BP, and BP will be right back in the litigation having paid $4 billion so far. Doesn't make any sense. We're trying to shut down the litigation. We're also trying to pay claimants. But I mean, you know, and 9-11 was the same thing. If you take the 9-11 money, you can't sue any of the domestic alleged tort fees. The airlines, the World Trade Center, Boeing, the mass port, the security guard companies, etc. Now again, you know, people jump on that. I don't understand. You got paid from BP. And you get paid by B, from BP. Why can't you sue others as well? I don't think anybody thinks. I mean, if you know the law of release, you know that a release is global. That was what the 9-11 fund did. That's what Virginia, well, not Virginia Tech. That's what the 9-11 fund did. That's what Agent Orange did. And that's what uh, we're trying to do with BP. We're trying to curtail litigation. Exxon Valdez, it's been 20 years. They're still litigating those cases. So. Uh, I, a follow up, I assume that BP has reserved their rights. Oh, that's another thing. <laughs> you can bet that BP is counting every nickel and will soon be litigating with Transocean and Halliburton on contribution as to who's really responsible for the explosion and how much we ought to allocate to each defendant. But that doesn't involve the claimant. That involves the co-defendants. As you know, Ken, some of our students submitted questions. And one of them asked, how can young attorneys get involved in ADR? What do you see as the best opportunities out of law school for someone who's interested in doing complex dispute resolution? Take courses in ADR, especially clinical courses, where you can go out in the field and see what it's like. And then, wherever you go to work, try and get as much ADR experience as you can. Most courts have ADR programs. Appellate courts have ADR programs. Also, network. Join the local bar associations. They usually have a committee on ADR. Just reach out and get as much experience as you can because on your resume, when it comes time to, you know, want to do this type of work, just demonstrate that you have some connection to ADR through practical experience in networking. Lisa, may I ask a follow-up to that? Please, Jay. And talk to Jay before he heads back to the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, you brought about a lot of change in uh, how 
some types of claims are handled, particularly the mass torts and, and complex cases. Um, how will that impact these new attorneys in their practice? And I can't help but note the statistic that's been used uh, when it was only 500,000 claims uh, against the Gulf uh, Fund. Uh, it was reported that only 3% of those 500,000 uh, had representation. And it, it, again, I, I don't know the reality, but it was also reported that you discouraged claimants from seeking representation. Uh, how will that change practice for folks? And could you comment on that? Because I'd like to hear more. I didn't discourage people from getting lawyers. In fact, we set up a pro bono program with the Mississippi Center for Justice. Today, any claimant who wants a lawyer can get a lawyer at no cost to the claimant, if the claimant qualifies. Most claimants don't want lawyers in a case like this. They want accountants is what they want, <laughs> not lawyers. Um, but I, I, I really, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a trial lawyer by tra training. I mean, I'm a big believer in the trial lawyers. I'm a supporter. I think, as I've said, the trial lawyers do a great, in 9-11, there would have never been success without the trial lawyers. They represented 9-11 victims 1,500 times uh, pro bono. I love the trial lawyers. Now, having said that, <laughs> no, 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 this is, this is a basic point I want to make. I, I, I'm a big ADR believer, like Jay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in alternative dispute resolution. But lawyers in this room don't have to worry about ADR. ADR is never going to replace the adversary system in our society. The litigation system, the courtroom in our society, like no other, it's ingrained in the fabric of our country, the history of our country. Go back and read de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, 1840. He writes, in 1840, it's very strange in the United States. We're going around the United States everywhere. Every major issue ends up in the courtroom, 1840. It's part of our society. So if I understand Jay's question, do lawyers have a role to play in ADR? Absolutely. I've told you how to get involved in that. Do lawyers have to worry that ADR may replace traditional lawyering? It will never, ever happen in this country. And so um, I think lawyers, young lawyers starting out, have good opportunities. They can represent clients in the courtroom or in a, in a, in a claims facility. They can represent clients in the courtroom. Or they can try and get into the world of ADR, which is expanding, and which people like Jay have made a national uh, priority. But I don't think you have to worry very much that we won't be teaching trial practice at Dayton. I think trial practice is here to stay. And that message came through loud and clear in your book. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Hagel, one final question. Uh, what are some of the ethical challenges you have? You've already talked a little bit about the perception of uh, lack of uh, objectivity that you're in the pocket of. But what, are there any other ones that you have to deal with? Oh, my goodness. Ethics? We could have a course in ethics here at Dayton. <laughs> Mr. Jones, you have filed a claim with the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. However, we can't process your claim because you're represented by Lawyer Jones. No, I'm not. Where did you get that idea? Where did I get that idea? We've got here a representation from Lawyer Jones that you are one of Lawyer Jones' clients in the GCCF. I never signed a retainer. Give me my money. Give you your money. Well, dear Mr. Feinberg, my name is Lawyer Jones. I have reason to believe that you have been talking to my clients directly in contravention of every professional ethics rule in every state. I do hope that I won't have to bring this to the local bar association. Very truly yours. <laughs> Mr. Jones, the client says that you don't represent them. We do. Well, you better work this out. All right, I can work it out. I'm on trial. It'll be about three weeks from now. Three weeks, he wants his money. Ethical dilemmas. I mean, that's a huge problem. 
where there's a disconnect between them. Do you know that there are 100 people in the Gulf Coast claims for claimants who have gone to the Justice Department claiming identity theft, that a lawyer is inappropriately using their name? So that's a problem. The second problem, frankly, is, you know, a claimant sends in their documentation and says, look, uh, under our methodology and my damages, I lost, uh, uh, you know, $30,000, pay me. Well, we look through, you know, really you lost $38,000, not thirty. So we'll give you $38,000. But you, you get some pushback here. Uh, Mr. Clayman, we think, give, give us another day or two. We're looking at your documentation and, 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 and we're not sure. And uh uh, I want 30 now. They're going to foreclose. No, but if you give us just another day or two, we're going to check and see if we can. No, nah, you're not listening. Now, when the claimant gets adamant about this, even though you think, you know, maybe they're entitled to $8,000 more and you try and explain it to people, can't wait, pay me now. It's a dilemma. Sometimes we think about going to a lawyer and say, go talk to the guy and see, you know. You know. So there are ethical issues. Um, there's also the ethical issue uh, that, that, that Professor Hegel, you know, we referenced earlier. He's not really independent. He's really practicing law. I'm not practicing law. I'm like an insurance adjuster. I'm not practicing law. I'm looking at your claim and I'm deciding what you ought to get. I'm not making uh, uh, legal findings. If you want to sue, go sue. It's a real problem. Um, the hurdles, it's not easy, but we're getting through it. I think we have time for one or two quick audience questions. Any from students? I want to give a preference to students. You got to be fast on your feet. Yes, please. Do you see this as a possible way for a corporation to in the long run actually save money? Well, absolutely. Corporations think all the time about doing this. They don't do it, but they think all the time about doing it. They don't do it because either they lack foresight in, in they, they worry about, I mean, I'm making some generalities here, but I, I've seen this. Either they worry about cost. Well, if we do it this way, it's going to cost us a lot of money. And if we do it the traditional litigation route, over the long run, maybe we'll, um, we'll, um, it, it will cost us less. I think that corporations aren't as forthright, as, as um, forward thinking as they should be about seeing alternatives to the litigation system. The other thing you find is if there's more than one corporation, they count each other's money, you see, and then you can't get it set up. For 25 years, Congress debated whether or not there ought to be an asbestos fund there's no asbestos fund. The employers couldn't agree with the manufacturers of asbestos, couldn't agree with the insurance companies. Who's going to pay the freight? That's the first question to ask yourself. If you want to set up one of these facilities, the five or six that I've worked on, who is going to pay for it? The taxpayer? 9-11. BP? 20 billion. Agent Orange? Eight chemical companies. One problem with these facilities, you can't set them up unless there's a deep pocket willing to fund the program. One final question. Do we have any students here? Yes. In regards to the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund and the recent Zadroga Act passed by Congress, um, are there any issues with first responders double dipping, so to speak, or also claiming under the drug Absolutely there will be. Don't forget, the 9-11 Fund during the lame duck session two months ago was reopened by Congress. For all those people that couldn't claim under the 9-11 fund because they hadn't manifested an injury by the time the fund expired. Now, the fund is reopened. So not only will those first responders come in for the first time, but former responders who got paid for emphysema and now have lung cancer, they'll come back in looking for additional funds. Fabulous questions. Thank Fabulous. You. Thank you all Let's very much. Let's thank Ken again for this time.